Madhava Kunjabi Hari Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Jaya Gopi Jana Vallabha Giri Vardhari Jasodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jasodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jasodanandana Prajajana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vanachahari Jamuna Tira Vanachahari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Prabhupada Jaya Prabhupada Prabhupada Jaya Prabhupada Jaya Prabhupada 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 Jaya Prabhupada Jaya Prabhupada 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 Jaya Prabhupada Jayam Vishnu Pada Paramahamsa Parivraja Kacharya Astatado Shri Shamad Stavine Gracial Abai Charanar Vinda Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shila Prabhupada Ki Askan Founder BBT Founder Shila Prabhupada Ki Ananta Kodi Vaishnav Vrinda Ki Iskan Chaupati Yatra Kija, 
Natai Go Premanande All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Shri Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga Go Premanande Hari Hari. I feel most fortunate to be in your nice association. So hopefully I may render some service for whatever it's worth to please you all. So you may bless me accordingly. Where's my friend Govinda? Yeah? Somewhere? Okay, you some guess. I didn't get Govinda's darshan yet. Okay. as it is, chapter 12 entitled A Devotional Service text 13 and 14 are grouped together Advesta Sarva Bhutanam Maitriya Karuna Evacha Nirmama Nirahankara Samadukha Sukhashami Santusta Satatam Yogi Yatatma Ritanishchaya Mayarpita Mano Buddha Yomad Bhakta Same Priya Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vrinta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Translation one who is not envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities, who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with a determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me, as such a devotee of mine, is very dear to me. And this is a perfect uh, description of Srila Prabhupada. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Coming again to the point of pure devotional service, the Lord is describing the transcendental qualifications of a pure devotee in these two verses. A pure devotee is never disturbed in any circumstances, nor is he envious of anyone, nor does a devotee become his enemy's enemy. He thinks this person is acting as my enemy, due to my own past misdeeds, so it is better to suffer than to protest." Unquote. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 14, 8, it is stated, Tatenu kampam shushamikshamanu bunjane evatma kritam vipakam 
Whenever a devotee is in distress or has fallen into difficulty, he thinks that it is the Lord's mercy upon him. He thinks, quote, Thanks to my past misdeeds, I should suffer far, far greater than I am suffering now. So it is by the mercy of the Supreme Lord that I am not getting all the punishment I am due. I am just getting a little by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Unquote. Therefore he is always calm, quiet and patient despite many distressful conditions. A devotee is also always kind to everyone, even to his enemy. Nirmama means that a devotee does not attach much importance to the pains and trouble pertaining to the body because he knows perfectly well that he is not the material body. He does not identify with the body, therefore he is freed from the conception of false ego and is equipoised in happiness and distress. He is tolerant and he is satisfied with whatever comes by the grace of the Supreme Lord. He does not endeavor much to achieve something with great difficulty. Therefore, he is always joyful. He is a completely perfect mystic because he is fixed in the instructions received from the spiritual master. And because his senses are controlled, he is determined. He is not swayed by false arguments because no one can lead him from the fixed determination of devotional service. He is fully conscious that Krishna is the eternal Lord, so no one can disturb him. All these qualifications enable him to fix his mind and intelligence entirely on the Supreme Lord. Such a standard of devotional service is undoubtedly very rare, but a devotee becomes situated in that stage by following the regulative principles of devotional service. Furthermore, the Lord says that such a devotee is very dear to him, for the Lord is always pleased with all his activities in full Krishna consciousness. Mamagyana Atimirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Vanchakalpa Tadubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanabhyo Vaishnavabhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare One important significant a leading disciple of Śrīla Prabhupāda uh, asked Śrīla Prabhupāda about envy. <clears throat> because uh, for some time prior to that uh, he was uh, suffering from envy of other devotees especially and he felt that it was disturbing his japa and also disturbing his relationships with the devotees. So when he inquired from Śrīla Prabhupāda uh, about him envious of devotees, so Śrīla Prabhupāda uh, responded, Can you think of any reasons not to, to be envious? So he reversed it. 
So this leading devotee, he thought of many reasons not to be envious of other devotees. And he came up with so many reasons like that. So then he came to the conclusion that Krishna is unlimited and his service is unlimited. So why should he be envious if someone else has some service and he does not? Other devotees can have their service, he felt, and he can have his service, so why should he be envious? Like that. Then he replied to Srila Prabhupada's question. Like that. So Srila Prabhupada asked the question, can you think of any reasons not to be envious? And then he simply replied, yes, there are many reasons not to be envious. Then Srila Prabhupada continued, and he said, all right. And then he described. He said that being envious means you don't like someone. Now, I thought about that exchange between this important devotee and Srila Prabhupada. There is a difference between being envious and there is a difference in being jealous. Envy is quite intense. But just like we give the example that uh, Srimati Radharani you know, she is jealous of Chandravali. But she is not envious. Is that okay? Yeah. So Srila Prabhupada cushioned the consciousness of the devotee who was querying from him and told him that being envious means you don't like somebody. Like so, now that not liking, Srila Prabhupada said, should be directed against the demons who create so much havoc in the world and cause disturbance to the devotees. Like that. So it should not be directed uh, to devotees. So this is in keeping with Srila Rupa Goswami's principle. Uh, Nirbandha Krishna Sambandhe Yukta Vairagya Muchet. In other words, the not liking cannot be given up, but it can be dovetailed. It can be dovetailed towards the demons, and especially dovetailed towards the atheistic scientists, which the Prabhupada dovetailed very well by calling them rascals. And also dovetailed towards the Mayavadis, or impersonalists who want to kill Krishna, kill the personality of Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada always became fiery-like, even towards the Mayavadis and and atheistic scientists. So when Srila Prabhupada gave this particular answer, I was reading um, some of 20 years ago, from the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And Srila Prabhupada quoted Naratam Das Thakur uh, from Prema Bhakti Chandrika. You know, Kroda Bhakti Dveshi Jane. So Kroda Bhakti Dveshi Jane indicates that the uh, uh, visible uh, uh, action of envy is anger. Envy in action is anger. It's like humility in action is tolerance. Like that. See? So when uh, Naratam Dastaka says, Kroda Bhakti Dveshi Jane, he indicates that anger should be used to punish a demon who is envious of the devotees. Like that. So therefore, uh, Kama and Kroda are quite different from the explanation I'm trying to rendered today to you. Generally we hear 
you know, karma is, krodha is, you know, rajya guna, samudha. Generally, here yeah, that we have to become free from lust. And whereas anger is uh, anujena. Anger is the baby who is born uh, from lust. Generally, we hear this, that we should be free from this. But here, uh, Prabhupada says that Naratun Dastakos has uh, have us understand that uh, using, you know, this anger which is coming from not liking, have their proper use in the service of the Supreme Personality of God at Krishna and as devotees. A devotee of the Lord cannot tolerate blasphemy of the Lord and his devotees. And the Lord similarly cannot tolerate blasphemy of his devotee. So therefore, Srila Prabhupada said that one should not at any one time tolerate uh, blasphemy and insults against the Lord, against the Lord and his devotees. A devotee by nature in his or her a mature, experienced and realized state is very humble and meek. And a devotee by nature is always reluctant to even pick up, pick a quarrel with anyone, including non-devotees. And therefore now does he envy anyone in that sense. However, a pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada said, immediately becomes fiery with anger when he sees that the Lord and his devotees are insulted or blasphemed. Like that. And Srila Prabhupada says that this is the duty of the, du- of the devotee, even if he is a pure devotee. Although a devotee maintains an attitude of meekness and gentleness, uh, it is a great fault on the part of the devotee if he remains silent when the Lord and his, dev- and his devotees are blasphemed or insulted. It is a great fault. It is actually blasphemous itself not to defend the Lord and his devotees when they are being insulted and so forth. Now, <clears throat> Iskan has been uh, there coming up in 2016 for almost 50 years from 1966 to 2016. So uh, we find uh, in some purport of Srila Prabhupada in the fourth canto in relation to uh, King Indra and Prithu Maharaj um, you know it says Videsham Visharaja in other words the king uh, Prithu Maharaj being a, uh, being a empowered personality in relation to the Lord he had to give up he had to give up and he became ashamed of his own activities in relation to uh, uh, to King Indra and because King Indra was also ashamed in that sense like that so there, uh, Srila Prabhupada uh, gives the uh, principle that um, uh, he says this is the first class example of a cooperative behavior between Vaishnavas. Like that. But uh, this was uh, written, the purport probably in the mid 70s when Srila Prabhupada became pronounced as the Jagat Guru or the World Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, like that. So here he says that uh, to the effect that devotees, and they can fight, it's not a problem. Like that. Because fighting gives some ras. <laughs> Otherwise it is boring. It is boring. Like that. But there should be cooperative behavior amongst Vaishnavas. Like that. So here, <clears throat> it is uh, quite interesting, actually, 
a very deep thing. So I thought about this. You know, Srila Prabhupada said that your love for me will be shown by how you cooperate to keep this institution together, you know, after I am gone. Like that. So first he said, your love for me. Like that. In other words, it was very difficult for them to have affection for each other. But they all had affection for the one person. Srila Prabhupada. So therefore he said, your love for me, but amongst yourselves it may not be so prominent. Like that, see. So cooperate to keep this institution, Eskon, which is non different from me, Srila Prabhupada said in another place. Like that. Now, given, say, hypothetically that Srila Prabhupada made this statement in 1977, and now we're in the year 2012. How many years? 35 years. Just given hypothetically as a safe measure. Like that. So, 35 years later, he may have made the statement before that, because this was when he was translating the fourth canto. Like that. But at least 35 years or more ago, and this spirit of cooperation was given as an instruction by Srila Prabhupada. Like that. So if you look at the context of it at that time, they were definitely fighting with each other. That is why he has to say it like that. But are we still fighting with each other 35 years later? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Cooperation is only there if there's no faith and relationship amongst each other. Like that. One only cooperates if there's no faith and relationship. Otherwise, there's no need to cooperate. If there's, if there's an intimacy of faith and relationship amongst devotees, you do not have to tell them to cooperate. Like that. So therefore, 35 years later, we should have learned as a society that we don't need to cooperate because we have intimacy of relationships with each other on the spiritual platform. There's no need for cooperation. So because we love each other with Srila Prabhupada in the center in terms of his instructions, so this instruction will not, should not apply even today. Why do we still need ombudsman and mediation? We don't really need that. But we need it because that cooperative spirit still has to be there. Otherwise, those things are not needed on the basis of relationship and faith. Now, uh, speaking for myself personally, um, you know, each Advesha Samutena, Dwanda Mohena, Bharata, Sarva Bhutani, Samoha, Sarge, Yanti Parantapa. So, Icha and Dvesha, from a personal perspective, one is born. I am born with material desire and Dvesha. Dvesha means hate, which is actually a visible activity of envy. Hate. So if I am born with material desire and I am born with enviousness in the form of hate for other living entities, how to get rid of that? How to get rid of that? So Srila Prabhupada, he gives a very nice example in this regard. He says that mango is so nice And mango, either green or ripened, is always good. And he called it Falakaraja, the king of all fruits, Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada said, in fact, sometimes on the market, the green mango is more expensive than the ripe mango. Because you can make 
pickles, you know, so many achar. You can't make a ripe mango. Like that. So if the green mango is more expensive than the ripe mango, then there must be some value to it. Like that. So similarly, uh, uh, the uh, green mango, when one associates with it, even in these beginning stages, you just bite into a mango that is forming, it tastes, you know, you, you, your face will like cringe. It tastes what? Taste? It tastes bitter. Like that. It tastes bitter. But if that mango is attached still to the tree and there's a watering process and the sunlight is coming, that mango will mature into bitter sour to sour sweet and then sweet. Provided it receives two principal things. The watering process and the sunlight. So similarly, a devotee may be bitter to associate with. But so long as you see that the devotee is chanting watering process, especially one's japa, and so long as the devotee is attracted to the association of devotees and not in the darkness of ignorance, but in the sunlight of the association of devotees, so long as a devotee is connected to those two, chanting the holy names, watering, Mahaprabhu likens that to watering the Bhakti Lata Beach, a devotional creeper. One should tolerate the bitter association of such a devotee. And Srila Prabhupada used the same analogy and he said, mango is green. And mango is ripe, but both are mango. So similarly, a devotee may be green and bitter to associate with, like a green mango. And a devotee may be ripe and sweet to associate with, but both are devotee. Both are devotee. Like that. Now, obviously, according to many injunctions of the scriptures, we should not intimately associate with non-devotees. You you know the reason why. You may become again like them. But we only associate with non-devotees by giving association to make them devotees, so we are influencing them. Like that. So there's no problem there. Like that. But in the association of devotees, you have to give and take association. And sometimes you have to take the bitterness of the association of a devotee who is like the green mango. Like that. See? So when that happens, <clears throat> sometimes it becomes intolerable. Sometimes it becomes stressful and sometimes it becomes depressive in the association of devotees. Like that. Now, why is that? Because one may, something may enter into one's consciousness and feel, maybe I should go somewhere else, another temple, another congregation and so forth. And then Srila Prabhupada commented in that mood that wherever you go, a Bengali is saying, your forehead always goes with you. So the grass is never green on the other side. Your mentality and consciousness goes with you. Like that. So it is of a sense of a higher arrangement in realization, but it may be in theory initially, that if you are placed in a particular community or association of devotees, it is for this purpose. It is for this purpose to associate with devotees who are like the green mango. Bitter to associate with. 
Now it would be very boring and it would be tedious to only associate with devotees who are sweet. An association of devotees is like taking a feast according to Gaudiya Vaishnava culture. When you take a feast, which preparation you take first? Bitter. <laughs> Karela, you know? Methi. Huh? Bitter melon. So when you take the bitter melon uh, preparation first, it creates, it's actually very scientific eating, honoring Pusat. It creates within the taste buds the hankering for the bitter sour preparations. And the bitter sour preparations creates within the taste buds for the other preparations to come and eventually the sweet preparations. Now you can understand that if you immediately only eat sweets, it will taste sweet. But if you go through the taste of bitter, bitter sour, and then you taste sweet, that sweet will taste even sweeter still, because of its variety and variegatedness of comparative taste. Like that. So similarly, association of devotees is like taking a feast. Like that. One will experience a bitter association to relish the sweetness of devotee association. Otherwise it will not be sweet. It definitely will be boring and tedious and routine. Everything is so sweet. Why? Like that. See? So this is also in the spiritual world. Like that. It is, which we'll discuss later on if we get time. Like that. Now, Srila Prabhupada gave the most lectures on two verses. On two verses. Sometimes he paraphrases those lectures. Like that. And those two verses are Dehinosmin Yata Dehe Komaran Yovanam Jara Tata Dehantara Praptir Full stop. We all know we're not this body, we're spirit soul. But the fourth line, Dearas Tata Namo Yati, is the actual transformation of consciousness. A sober person is not bewildered by the change of the body, but we become bewildered. So how to become sober, dira, from the drunken state of the bodily conception of life? By our own efforts and strength in Krishna consciousness, it is impossible. Even if you chant one billion rounds of japa, or even if you have a strict sadhana, it is impossible. Like that. So therefore Krishna gives the next verse. Matra spasas, this sensory perception. Matra spasas to kuntaya, sitoshna sukadukada. So this sita and ushna, this winter and summer, when winter comes, you can easily make an atmosphere adjustment. You get a heater. And when summer comes, you also adjust fan, air conditioning, he says that. But sukha and dukkha, you cannot make an adjustment. Therefore, agama, pioneer, anitius. You cannot stop it from coming. It will come anyway, whether we are expecting it or whether we are not expecting it. Therefore, tam titik sasva, Bharata. One should tolerate without being disturbed. But easier said than done. So what is that situation that Krishna places us in to become free? 
from the misidentification of the bodily conception of life, which is the basis of spiritual life to make advancement. What is that situation that Krishna places us in? When we associate with non-devotees intimately, we are not going to become free from the drunken state. We are not going to become sobered from the drunken state of the bodily conception of life. Only when we are in the association of devotees can one become free from the drunken state, become sober from the drunken state of the bodily conception of life. So therefore, tam titiksasva bharata. One should tolerate the association of devotees, especially tolerating the association of the bitter mango devotee. Now, the more one tolerates the association of the bitter mango devotee, the more bitter mangoes devotees will come for your association. It is a natural consequence. And the more you do not tolerate the association of bitter mangoes devotees, you are looking for devotees who are sweet to associate with. That means your tolerance level is down. So the more the more we tolerate the association of devotees, the less we have to tolerate. Is it sinking in? And the more you have to tolerate the association of devotees with less and less effort, then it comes to a point you don't need to tolerate at all. There's no effort. It is natural. It is not part of you. You are that unknowingly to you. When you do not know you're tolerating the association of devotees, that is 100% humility. But it is not like this. Just like if I'm walking. Can you see? I'm walking. Right? Now, if I am walking, I am telling you, can you see I'm walking? Can you see I'm walking? Can you see? Can you see? Can you see I'm walking? Yes. When you tell somebody you're walking and you are walking, you are pagla. You are mad and you are crazy. Because somebody else will say, Why are you telling me you're walking? Of course I can see you walking. You don't need to tell me that. So that is called false humility. When you tell someone I am humble, you are the most puffed up person. (laughs) Can you see I am humble? Can you see? (laughs) That means pagla, crazy. Like that. So humility in the form of natural tolerance of the association of devotees is not for sale, is not for argument, is not for advertisement, is not for debate, is not for logic, is not for reasoning, is not for discussion, it is not for philosophy and neither can it be understood. Because that's how bewildering is when you associate with someone and you feel the humility without them knowing that you feel the humility. It is like that. See? 
So when one is naturally 100% tolerant of the association of devotees, and one doesn't know it, one doesn't, there's no effort, there's no sadhana for that. One doesn't know it. And therefore one is 100% humble. And one doesn't know that either. Like that. Then something else happens in the consciousness of that person unknowingly to that person. The consciousness that happens, it reverses that I am not tolerating devotees anymore. The devotees are tolerating me because I am the bitter mango. At first I used to tolerate them, but now I realize that I am the one that is bitter to associate with. Like that. And then one feels, I don't deserve to be in the association of devotees. I don't have any adhikar, I don't have any qualification to be in the association of devotees. But somehow they are tolerating me and keeping me with them. What causeless mercy is this? I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. And then one feels this chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. And when one feels, I do not want to chant this name. I do not want to chant this name. But somehow my lips are moving and it is chanting. I don't deserve this. This chanting. And I don't deserve to be in the association of devotees. But somehow I am still there. And then one feels, every time I try to leave the devotees, and every time I try to not chant, both are not stopping. Although I am so bitter. And then one feels internally. When will that day come? When I will begin to become a devotee. Right now I am not that. Because I am so bitter to associate with. Like that. So therefore, that type of consciousness... It's not artificial, but it removes all envy for not for devotees, but there's no envy for any living entity like that. So this was so wonderfully exemplified by Srila Prabhupada and even further exemplified through his mercy by his sincere and serious followers. And there are so many in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. I don't know, time-wise, how we're doing. Hmm? And questions? After 2.30. Okay. Now, I mentioned earlier on that... uh, (coughs) that there are such instances in the spiritual nature. And I said, just like Srimati Radharani is jealous of Chandravali. Like that. But Chandravali is a humble devotee. She is not jealous of Srimati Radharani. Like that. It it is like that. Now, when we discuss uh, Radha Krishna Leela, we have to lay a premise or foundation, otherwise it may be easily misunderstood. Like that. So, uh, Radha Krishna are actually one supreme soul in two forms. So, therefore, they are inseparable. Like that. So, the example is given 
of fire by Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami that emanates heat and light. Like that. Now, fire emanates heat and light or musk emanates and fragrance. Now let's stick to one example. The heat and light comes from fire. But fire cannot experience heat and light. This is true. Fire can only exist in association with others from the vantage point of this earthly planet. You cannot associate with fire. But you can associate with fire through the emanation of its heat and light. So similarly, heat and light has no existence without the existence of fire. But fire has no association without the existence of heat and light. So similarly, Krishna as the fire, he cannot have any association without Radharani, who is like the heat and light. And at the same time, Krishna cannot experience Radharani's love for him. Just like although she comes from Krishna, but like the fire cannot experience heat and light, although it comes from fire. So therefore, Krishna Krishna has covered as Goswami says that they are one supreme soul in two forms for the sake of pleasure, ras or rasa. Like that. So we have to understand that from that perspective. You cannot separate heat and light from fire and neither can you separate fire from heat and light because both will have no meaning if it's separated. At the same time, it is inseparable. There's no meaning to separate them. Like that. So uh, one time, in ecstatic, you could say, anger uh, for Krishna as the object, like that. Uh, when Mother Rohini, she heard the uh, uh, roaring sound of the twin Arjuna trees falling. This is all given by Srila Prabhupada in his books, especially Nectar of Devotion, like that. So when she heard the two twin Arjuna trees falling, like that, or the whole neighborhood immediately proceeded to that place from the source of that sound. Like that. So immediately Mother Rohini saw that, oh, Krishna was in a very precarious position. He could have almost been killed by those trees. Like that. And immediately when she saw that, a consciousness was the consciousness of Mother Yasoda. Like that. She immediately looked at Mother Yasoda and she said, You may be very expert in giving lessons to your son by binding him with rope, but can't you see that you left your son in the dangerous spot? You know, rebuking her, completely angry with Mother Yasoda. Like that. And you can see that the trees are falling down and he's simply loitering there. Is this how you take care of your son? Like that. So Srila Prabhupada and Srila Rupa Goswami says this is an expression of anger in ecstatic love. We perform bhakti yoga in anger, but this is bhakti in anger. The yoga falls off. Like that. Yeah. His ecstatic love for Krishna causes this anger in Madhuruhini to rebuke Mother Yasoda. Like that. See? And then immediately Mother Yasoda understood a so called fault in Lila Shakti. Like that. So she went to Krishna. Krishna says, huh? You? Not you. And Nanda Maharaja to come in and take Krishna. Like that. See? So from the anger of Mother Rohini in Bhakti, Nanda Maharaja's affection was more wanted by Krishna rather than Mother Yasoda. 
although she is higher in rust. At the same time, Mother Yasoda goes into another ecstatic depression. That is also ecstatic love. She is depressed that Mother, that this Krishna has rejected me. Like that. So there is anger, there is overwhelming affection ordinarily not given to Nanda Maharaj and there is depression. In Krishna Lila. Like that. So another instance of uh, anger is that uh, when Srimati Radharani was quite dissatisfied with the behavior of Krishna being with Chandravali, like that, so therefore she stopped talking to him. When Krishna approaches, I don't want to speak to you. It's like Nara Leela, human-like, like that. So Krishna was very depressed, extremely depressed. So eventually he approached Srimati Radharani, who was completely dissatisfied, to beg for forgiveness. And this is known as Man, it's famous. But Prabhupada also calls it jealous anger. Not just anger, but an anger imbued with jealousy, not envy. Like that. See? And Krishna fell down at her feet and begging, you know, you please forgive me. But Radharani, she was still not satisfied and she refused to speak to him. At that time, one of her friends was observing this immediately chastised and became angry with Sri Mati Radharani. Like that. And chastised her. Oh, you are allowing yourself to be, you know, churned by the association of dissatisfaction personified. What is this? Like that. What can I say to you? The only advice I can give you is that you immediately change your misbehavior and stop giving me pain to see Krishna is in pain. Like that. Very angry, this friend of Radharani. Like that. And, and she said, I cannot, I cannot, uh, in other words, I cannot bear to see your behavior, because I can see, I cannot even see Krishna's face. The only thing I can see that now, is that his peacock feather is touching your feet. Like that. And still you appear to be so red faced. Change. Like that. So this is in Lila Shakti. Like that. And then Srila Prabhupada quotes Vidagda Madhava. Like that. Wherein Srimati Radharani in an angry mood. She is angry with Krishna on one side. But then she gets angry when she is accused of going to Krishna. So it is contradictory. When she is with Krishna, she is angry, like that. And then when Mother Purnamasi accuses her, Oh, you are going to Krishna? Like that, or you were with Krishna? Then Radharani declares in an angry mood, Oh, what can I say to you? You are telling me I am with Krishna. This Krishna is so cruel that he even often attacks me right on the street in front of everyone. So why are you telling me I am attracted to this boy? Like that. And when I cry out loudly, this boy, she addresses him as boy. This boy with the peacock feather on his head. What he does? He immediately covers my face before I scream and I cry loudly. Like that. And when I want to go away from the scene, he immediately blocks, you know, the way. Like that. And then he becomes angry. And in an angry mood, he bites my face. Like that. So Mother Purnamasi, just try to understand my situation. And don't necessarily be angry with me, but instead you tell me how I can save myself 
from these terrible attacks from this Krishna. Like that. But we know she doesn't really mean it. It's part of the ras. Like that. So sometimes uh, uh, in the ecstasy in anger, which is not out of envy, there's no envy in the spiritual world, Prabhupada said that. Like that. Uh, uh, we know that uh, Jatila, Srila Prabhupada gives his example, is the apparent mother-in-law of Srimati Radharani. And Mukara is the mother of Ketida, so therefore she is the great-grandmother of or grandmother of Radharani, like that. So one time, um, Krishna was with Srimati Radharani, like that. So then, you know, Mukara, she came to see Jatila. You know why? Because Jatila must be kept busy, in that sense. So Jatila uh, was speaking to uh, Mukara and said, you know, this Radharani, you know, it's like she's a big embarrassment to our family. Like that. Why? Because Krishna unnecessarily harasses her and we don't know whether she likes it or not. She doesn't really reveal anything like that. So then um, Jatila said, So Mukara said, Why are you against Krishna? Like that. You know, they started this thing. Why are you against Krishna? And Mukara is more sane. Jatila is more crazy. Like that. Yeah. Why are you against Krishna? What's wrong with that? Like that. So immediately when Mukara said that, this created anger in Jatila. And he said, you cruel face Mukara, by hearing your words, my heart feels like it's burning in fire. And then Mukara becomes angry and she replied, you sinful Jatila, by hearing your words, I'm getting headaches. You know, you cannot give any evidence that Krishna has attacked Srimati Radharani, you know, who is the daughter of my granddaughter. Ketida. Ketida is the granddaughter of Mukara, so she is a great grandmother of uh, Srimati Radharani. So while this exchange is going on, Mukara had to like subside with the anger, but it takes longer for Jatila to subside with the anger. It takes a long time. So in that lengthy time, they are being infused and agitated with anger, Radha and Krishna are together. Like that. So once when uh, Radharani was taking off a necklace given by Krishna, Jatila, a mother-in-law, told a friend, you see, you see that beautiful necklace that she has? It was given by Krishna uh, to her. She is now holding it and she does not want to tell us that she has connection with Krishna. By holding that necklace, I can see that she is connected to Krishna. And therefore, her activities have disgraced our whole family. Now, what does that mean? It means that Jatila is Krishna conscious. It's a wonderful thing. So, this is called Bhakti in anger. Like that. So coming back to ground. <laughs> How can we apply this when Srila Prabhupada said, and we will have another ISKCON in the spiritual world. Like that. How can we apply this? We know <clears throat> that a mother will chastise the son. 
And we know sometimes the son will chastise the mother. And they'll be angry with each other. But the mother will never stop feeding the son. And the son will never stop accepting food from the mother. Why? Because the relationship will never break. Will never ever break. So if you apply that simple experience in a cultured environment in the material world, why can it not be applied spiritually in the association of devotees? Look at We should argue. We should fight. We should be dissatisfied with each other. But do not break the relationship. Never break the relationship. Now, why is this? Because Prabhupada has come Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesh and Sunyavad. We are deeply personal with each other without offending, even in anger, even being disturbed, even being agitated with each other in devotional service. Yes, that is very much internally personal. Very much personal. It will kick out like that. So one can ask oneself the question, do you have a friend in devotional service a friend, a true, genuine friend. Well, I will correct myself. A friend is a friend. If you use the word true, genuine, it indicates that is friend. In other words, if somebody is not genuine and not true, in terms of the friendship, that is not friend. So friend by its quality and nature is genuine and true. Like that. Now, does one have a friend or more than one friend that you can pick up the phone or you can go to their door and bang on it and say, I have to speak to you now. Do you have a friend that you can scream at. This is in the spiritual world. Right? It is in the spiritual world. If you know the exchanges of Madhu Mangal with Krishna, you'll understand. Like that. If you know the exchanges of Sridham and Subal with each other, you'll understand. When Radharani says to Krishna, I don't want to see your face again. Go away. Literally screaming. Like that. So these things are there without offense. Without Vaishnava Prat. And if you don't have such a friend in Krishna consciousness that you can be personal that you can actually express who you are from inside and not put on an artificial external show that everything is going well. If you don't have such a person, you may need to see a psychologist or psychiatrist. <laughs> you can see, this is Jwala Mukhi. <laughs> see, she's red-faced, be careful. Like that. Now I'm giving this example that the relationship with my mother is so intimate that I know I didn't do anything wrong and she's angry with me. You understand the point? So similarly amongst friends in Krishna consciousness, you can get angry with your friend for no reason. Like that. Why? 
Because if you shout at somebody for no reason who is not your friend, there is bigger trouble. <laughs> See? And the, the feelings of the heart has to be reposed somewhere. It cannot be kept inside. If it kept inside, one day you will become a volcano and erupt in the wrong place. Like that. I have friends like that in Krishna consciousness. In every part of the world I travel extensively. Like I can go up to someone and just like, you know, I wouldn't say Prabhu, I say, hey. You know, I can speak to the person in like casual language because we have that intimacy. Like that. So then they'll say, at that time, you know, even now, at that time they'll say, Prabhu, or they'll say, Maharaj, something is disturbing you, huh? I'll say, yes, let's talk about it. So I'll say, I'm so stressed in traveling. When I went to this place, you know, it's like I was the only one at Mangalati. <laughs> You know, I, I'm like concerned about the movement. You know, you get stressed. But it's good stress, you know, about the welfare of his skin and things like that. So we talk. We talk about the welfare of the movement. We talk about the legacy that Srila Prabhupada has given us. It's stressful, but it's good. Like that. See? Or if something is disturbing me, like that. Something is disturbing me. So, even a friend, even if the friend is not at fault, you can make them feel at fault and they are still friend. Like, still friend. Like. Questions? Comments? Yes, Maha Prabhu Prabhu. Uh-huh. Because you can scream at them all the time. <laughs> Actually, I know Mahaprabhu Prabhu for some time. Like that. And our relationship has no formality. He can tell me whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. <laughs> that means I'm his friend. So you have at least one friend. <laughs> okay. Now to answer his question, how to get such a friend is not by sadhana. I'll give the same example is not by vairagya, not by tapasya, and is not by piety, karma. And it's not by eligibility of being advanced or less advanced or more advanced. It's not the eligibility of being a kanista or madhyam or uttama adhikari. There's no such thing in friendship. So my own example again. I am junior in all respects to my mother. Isn't it? But she can tell me anything she wants and I can tell her anything I want. So this aspect of junior and senior does not exist in friendship. So although Mahaprabhu may be senior in so many years in age and senior in realization and senior in Krishna consciousness, but in friendship that does not exist. So don't look at up, don't look up to a counselor, or don't look up to a counselee, or don't look up to a, 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 a spiritual authority or a service authority or a or guru. Don't look up to such designations as for a friend, because in friendship there is no designations. There is no designation. 
so such type of friendship is not based on organization institution and it is not based on formalities of regulations it is the natural language of the heart it comes by its own accord based on your sincerity and seriousness and krishna consciousness you cannot designate it you cannot give it a sarva upadi you cannot give it an upadi it is free from sarva upadi vinir mukta so, so therefore it is free from this nirmala free from all uh, sorts of designations like that it comes out of his own natural accord you will naturally feel i have friends here i have many friends here i naturally feel and they naturally feel but that feeling of mutual you know the feeling of mutual nature of the friendship is not spoken but the activities we know by dealing with each other that we are friends so it's not something you can analyze it's not something that you can sort of uh, you know create or something like that it's nothing like that it's of its own nature of the language of the heart friendship is like that why because such friendships can never be broken the nature of a friend is that it is eternal it is eternal so if if a friendship is broken it was not friendship in the first place it is temporary like that is that okay ma prabhu for now at least i feel secure you are my friend so you can scream at me at any time you like thank you another hari krishna uh, one second we'll balance this mata ji has a hand <laughs> microphone here give microphone on the side uh she is connected to this side because she is wearing saffron <laughs> so don't feel don't feel so bad it's good she is wearing saffron uh, what's your Maharaj, name what's uh, your name my name is medavini saki devi dasi medavi medavini saki devi dasi medavini saki devi dasi so tell us uh, thank you maharaj for the wonderful class Uh, what was wonderful <laughs> it was In- uh, inspire me uh, first tell me what was wonderful uh, uh, the class uh, the class was very interesting uh, what was interesting <laughs> we need substance the interesting not uh, shadow yeah uh, i found it very interesting because it made me think uh, i was uh, i was uh, thinking about the difference between uh, what is jealousy and envy nice. like you said jealousy uh, jealous there is place for jealousy in the spiritual world while there is no place for envy just so, like two sisters are jealous of each other but they never give up the relationship of being sisters all right mata ji I give another example of jealousy. You know two sisters they jealous of each other but they never give up the relationship of being sisters. And if they acting in if they acting in a way that jealous of each other and you see it don't go in between because you'll become the enemy. <laughs> so good so nice points you're making about jealousy and envy. So now tell me your question. my maharaj my question is also related actually what is the basic distinction between jealousy and envy actually like what starts as jealousy may uh, subsequently lead to envy or uh, you know how do we uh, differentiate at what point does jealousy actually become envy don't differentiate because you'll never know don't analyze your own problem hmm like that therefore we need a disciplic succession 
we need Shiksha and Diksha Guru. Don't analyze your own problem. Like that. The best way to uh, kick out uh, envy or jealousy is to serve the person that you envious of. Vaishnav Seva. And it may be difficult, but you'll feel relieved. Just initializing that thought process that I should serve this person I don't like. Just try to do that. Even if you do not actually serve the person, but the consciousness of serving the person will kick this out almost immediately. Like that. And then sometimes you may carry the vestige, I don't like, I don't like. But suddenly you meet the person and suddenly you're speaking nice words to the person. You're shocked at yourself. Say, huh, I don't like this person but I'm glorifying. But don't think Saraswati is speaking to your tongue. No. (laughs) That is actually your heart. Because you're overcoming the crazy mind. That's all. Like that. So you try like that. See? Don't think of serving the Vaishnav. Do it. Too big difference. Like that. Thank you, Mahamad. Okay. So, one devotee is Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj your, your name? Uh, Manish Goyal. Manish. Yes. Okay. Maharaj, you shared this um, un- mango analogy that can help us understand how to practice tolerance. And you shared also that one day, you know, I may realize that I am the bitter mango. So is this the perfect mood to practice because... It's not a practice. It's not a mood. Because then I might not relish so much that is offered in Krishna consciousness. Yes. The main thing is that uh, you may have to digest this a little bit, what I'm about to say. Hmm. You know, a devotee is a friend of every living entity. See? But it doesn't mean you go and embrace a lion. You keep a respectful distance from a lion. Is that okay? Yeah. Although a devotee is a friend of living and every living entity, in terms of sadhu sangha, in terms of sadhu sangha, there should be a discrimination on the basis of no discrimination. Now that is contradictory in its statement in itself. See? When you discriminate who you want to serve, then immediately you know that the person you do not want to serve, you should serve. Is that all right? Yeah. That not liking not to serve a particular devotee should become a liking in terms of serving that person. Because it is easy to serve someone you like, isn't it? It is easy to serve someone you like. But that's not what we are talking about. We are talking about that tolerance will come naturally quicker without you putting much effort into it if you serve someone you don't like. So therefore we should discriminate without discrimination. We are first discriminating that we like to serve somebody we like, but we we discriminate, then we know who we don't like, then without discrimination you serve that person. That's the only way. Vaishnav Seva. So the intimacy of Vaishnav Seva is different from a devotee is a friend of every living entity. Is that all right for now? Yeah. I can give a more elaborate answer. It may take a longer time, but we'll give chance to others. How time? How much time we have? 
few more minutes. Huh? Hari we'll, we'll take one more question. There are several questions, so we don't know how to discriminate here. <laughs> okay, we'll take two more questions, but we don't know how long the answers may be too. Somebody is desperate and they already have the microphone, so we have to hear his question. What's your name? Uh, my name is Gopal Leela Das. Rupa? Gopal Leela Das. Rupa Leela. Okay. Uh, thanks for inspiring class, Maharaj. Uh, what my, was inspiring? <laughs> the inspiring <laughs> which I felt is basically uh, you I, mentioned... I'm teaching you something. You must give substance. You know, uh, when you want to, not that I need to be appreciated, it's just a, I'm just an educationist, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm stuck in being an educationist. <laughs> when you say thank you for the inspiring class, you should say, Marge, uh, I like this point that you made. You understand the point? Some substance has to be there. I, I'm sorry, I'm thinking I'm in the classroom, just forgive me. <laughs> Yeah, the most inspiring point which I liked is, Maharaj, is the way you mentioned that we have to tolerate the bitter devotees and eventually you will realize that you are the one who are bitter and the others are tolerating you. Yes. Now what's your question? Yeah, the question. The question is, that I, I just need one clarification in regards to, you mentioned that uh, we uh, we have to tolerate the bitter devotees and eventually you will attract more bitter devotees, the association of more bitter devotees. So, just need a clarification, a little more focus on that. See, when others see you as sweet, when others see you as sweet, you don't know. So, those bitter devotees who see you as sweet will come to you. I didn't want to mention it because you'll get puffed up and think I'm sweet. <laughs> you know, you think I'm, I'm such a sweet devotee, therefore so many bitter devotees are coming to me. <laughs> but that's how it is. That's how it is. And it's not a question of spiritual advancement. It's a question of affection. It's a question of it's a question, I don't know. You are attracting bitter devotees to you because you are there for them. They, they see something in you that uh, will help them in this spiritual advancement. But it mustn't make you proud. Oh, you know, everyone's coming to me. Maybe I am a pure devotee. Yeah. The last name of Maya for devotees is to feel that I am a pure devotee. That is plain Maya. <laughs> like that. Because when you are a pure devotee and you are on top, you can only go down. You will fall. One must fall. So I didn't want to say it in the exchange of the lecture, but since you asked, I had to say it. Is that all right? Any of the Vaishnavis, Matajis? Have a question? This is impersonal. Who asked the question? Who asked the question? Who wrote this down? Any subtle bodies here? <laughs> Please take on your gross form and manifest yourself. <laughs> See, a sannyasi is the father of all ashrams. And a sannyasi adopts children on behalf of the Supreme Lord. So I am your father, don't be shy. Even if you are older than me in age. So, who wrote the question? <laughs> you? Mm -hmm. Okay, give her the microphone. Because she felt 
that she may not get a chance to ask a question. So therefore she wrote it and sent the slip forward. So give her the microphone. Otherwise she may not sleep tonight. <laughs> well. What's your name? Gayatri, I heard that part. Your name is Gayatri. Tell us your question. Yeah, a microphone should be on, right? Yes, help. Somebody help. Who knows? Dandas Maharaj, uh, my, uh, I, uh, what inspired me in your class was, uh, we have to understand that we are the bitter devotee, means I am the bitter devotee. Uh, so and we learned yeah, from that um, to that to that. <laughs> nice. Yes. Basically, Maharaj, I just wanted uh, your realization of, uh, you are 100% dedicated uh, in the service of uh, your Guru. So, basically... No. Uh, <laughs> I am 100% dedicated in the service of... Shri Shri Radha and Krishna, which comes through the consciousness of the disciplic succession. Okay. It's not just Guru. You understand? Others it can become Guru fanaticism. We are not in that category. You are 100% dedicated to Radha and Krishna's service. Yes. <laughs> through the mercy of the disciplic succession. Yes. Now tell me your question. <laughs> Maharaj, I wanted your realization because many times we get uh, kind of attached, materially attached. Uh, these attachments are not uh, good for us. So we cannot dedicate 100% uh, in, the of, in, in the service of Guru and Krishna in mm. the disciplic success uh, and uh, we don't get blessings of in disciplic succession. So, nice. Uh, and so therefore I, it's, it's Shri Shri Guru and Goranga. It's never alone. It's Hari Guru and Vaishnavas. It's never alone. These things are there. So your question is you want uh, me to share some realization about cent percent surrender. Something like that? Yeah. And your question is imbued uh, with the attachment in terms of, you know, uh, I have attachments, but you're feeling I have no attachments. So you have attachments, but because of attachments you cannot 100% engage in the service of the Lord and His devotees. Is that your question? Like that. Now, did anybody tell you to give up attachments? Hmm? Yes, Krishna consciousness is not about detachment and attachment. That is Mayavad. The Mayavad has nothing to do with the material nature, but they want to become the material nature themselves. They never become the spiritual nature. Like that. So if you have some attachments, you do not have to give it up. All you have to do is use your attachment in Krishna conscious activities. You know, if you have a wife, use her in Krishna's service. If you have a husband, use him in Krishna's service. But if the husband is not favorable, then unknowingly use him in Krishna's service, without him knowing. If you have a son or daughter, use them in Krishna's service. Don't give up the son and daughter, but use them in Krishna's service. If you have some talent, use it in Krishna's service. If you have some gifts, use it in Krishna's service. If you have some money, use it in Krishna's service. If you have some influence, use it in Krishna's service. This is Rupa Goswami's philosophy and practicality that Prabhupada has given us. Yukta Vairagya Mochita. So it is not necessarily you have to give up. But you just dovetail and use your attachments in, in Krishna's service. Is it okay? 
A sannyasi does not give up family life. A sannyasi accepts the whole world as his family. So there's no question of detachment. There's no question of detachment. Sannyasi never gives up family. He accepts the whole world as his family and adopts children to bring them to the Achutta Gotra, into the family of the Supreme Personality of God. Is that okay? Yeah. Now what to do? Hmm? The man is the man is always speaking. We need microphone for you. He's very eager to speak. Uh, he is an elder person, so we should honor his query. What's your good name? My name is Haridas. Haridas. Nice. My name is Haridas. Thank you. I bow down to you, sir. You said the language... Now, can you, can you eat the microphone? It would be better. You know, like, put ah, them as ah, if you're eating it. Yes. Ah. Lang- language of That's heart. Huh? You said language of heart. Language of heart. Yes. And just now you said that sannyasi for sannyasi, every, every in the entire world is family. Mm-hmm. Is it this uh, nothing but a pure love? I want to know only or confirm. Yes. Um, I'll give you an answer, not specifically for you, and then we'll conclude for today, right? But not specifically for you, but it's for everyone. Like that. See? Um, one of our most senior Vaishnavis, senior not by position, but, but advanced in consciousness. Like that. So her name is Madhe Yamuna. She is she has left in terms of a manifest presence, but she's still with us in consciousness. So one time, um, she was uh, in London in the formative days of Krishna consciousness there. So she was living in uh, like uh, in in a room. You have to go up the stairs, and there's a balcony like that. And then our, our founder, Acharya Srila Prabhupada, he visited London for the first time. So he was staying in the room next door. Like that. So when he came out of the balcony, like a veranda type that's outside, you know, overlooking the bottom floor, he, he saw Mother Yamuna also on the balcony. Like that. So, without speaking, like that, without speaking, you could see that Srila Prabhupada was full of love for her, like that. But she responded, you know, to reciprocate with Srila Prabhupada, like that. And she told Srila Prabhupada, I love you very much, like that. And Srila Prabhupada simply replied, Yes, I know. So this exchange reached the devotees in America. Like that. So another Mataji, disciple of Srila Prabhupada, she also felt the same way. And we all feel the same way of Srila Prabhupada. Like that. that. So in uh, expression, she also went up to Srila Prabhupada and she told Srila Prabhupada, I have to tell you something. But the way she told that to Srila Prabhupada, I have to tell you something, Prabhupada realized that it's like, it must not be within hearing distance of others. So Prabhupada called her aside, tell me, like that. See? So she told Srila Prabhupada, I love you very much. 
So Srila Prabhupada looked at her very sternly and he told her, don't talk nonsense, do something practical. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's different for different devotees and different disciples. So love is not an expression. Love is called a devotional service in an active state. Like that. So you have nice name, Haridas. So you are a servant of the name of Hari, which means the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Like that. So we do not say we love, we express our love by chanting the holy names. So this is what we will do now in Kirtan by chanting the holy names. I'm always shy to lead Kirtan. So if somebody else can lead, you'll relieve me of the anxiety of being forced to lead. Somebody? Where's, uh, where's Govinda? We'll meet him. Where's uh, Radha Gopinath Prabhu? They're all my close friends. I can scream at them. Where's our Shamananda? They all, okay, they're busy. We'll meet them. Okay. So who will lead Kirtan? Nityananda Prabhu. So we should stand up. Or? Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Ananta Koti Vaishnav Vrande Ki Jai. Shishi Radha Gopinath Yatra Ki Jai. Nitai Go Premanande Hari. So let us express our gratitude to His Holiness Bhakti Brihat Bhagavat Swami Maharaj by very loudly chanting. Hare Krishna!